the DNA repair system in bacteria. So in this particular case, RecA protein initiates the recombination repair, Rec for recombination. Uh, RecA protein also acts as a protease that destroys a repressor called LexA, and that allows the expression of repair polymerases like DNA polymerase 4 and 5. This slide illustrates that point. Um, in this particular case, you have, in this panel, you have normal DNA and the LexA repressor sitting on a 14 or 15 base pair SOS box in the promoter of these DNA repair enzymes. So the SOS genes are not induced. Obviously, there's no damaged DNA, so, so the system is turned off. Over here on the right, however, there is damaged DNA recognized, and as a result, um, RecA acts as a protease to destroy LexA, and so that's why the little pills are cut in half here that, are, that were once bound to the SOS box. With the LexA removed from the SOS box, the SOS genes can be switched on. And so some of those SOS genes are DNA genes encoding DNA polymerase 4 and DNA polymerase 5. So this slide just sort of gives you a sense for the um, repair mechanism itself. So here's polymerase 3, our main uh, polymerizing enzyme. And here's the beta clamp that I talked about that allows it to stick to the DNA. And as it moves around and in in, moves down in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, it bumps into a thymine dimer. And this dimer, again, is this unusual base pairing between the two T's here. And as a result, it causes a kink in the DNA chain. The polymerase will stop, and that will activate the SOS response that I just showed you with LexA and RecA. The results will be an upregulation of, of error-correcting polymerases, uh, 4 and 5. Here, are the, this is DIN-B is the gene that encodes it, and UMUD prime 2 C is another way to um, refer to polymerase uh, 5. So in this particular case, these guys, the DNA polymerase 3 and the beta clamp are removed, and the, um, these, either of these repair polymerases can repair over a lesion. That allows DNA polymerase 3 in the clamp to reassemble after the lesion and continue replication. Other ways we can, uh, so ways we can create genetic variation, that we, bacteria, can create genetic variation, um, obviously mutations, and those mutations are subject to selective pressure. So we know that, that each mutation, there's a lot of selective pressure on it. And, and if it's advantageous, the mutation is um, propagated in the population. And if it's not, that particular lineage goes extinct. Recombination is the process in which one or more nucleic acids are rearranged or combined to produce a new nucleotide sequence. So we call those recombinants. And I'll show you some of that in a minute. Different forms of, of um, DNA acquisition include these horizontal gene transfer mechanisms that I'll, that I'll talk about. They're really important in evolution because it's, I guess it's evolution in leaps and bounds, we call it, rather than just waiting on an accumulation of point mutations to, to, to change your phenotype. This is the acquisition of huge amounts of DNA all at once that can change things dramatically. They can expand your host range, for example, if you're a pathogen, or they can allow you to overcome antibiotics or to eat a particular nutrient in soil that other microbes um, can't. So the three main mechanisms of horizontal gene transfer are illustrated here, and I also have um, animations for some of these things, like transformation, for example, and transduction and conjugation. So I have animations for those. Um, but anyway, the, the concept of transformation is just the transfer of free DNA from the environment to a recipient. So here's our recipient in the center. Over here is a, um, a bacterium that has undergone lysis. Something happened to it, you know, it's all broken up and pieces of its DNA are being released into the environment. And then some of these pieces can be taken up by the bacterium. If they happen to be useful pieces, like something with an antibiotic resistance on it, the microbe might accumulate it and, and propagate it. Over here, you see conjugation in which you have a donor cell that has a plasmid that it's able to transfer to a recipient. And if the plasmid has useful features on it, the plasmid might be retained. And then over here is a, the concept of transduction, in which a virus actually acquires genetic, DNA, genetic information from a 
from a host and then packages that genetic information into its little phage head here and then goes out into the world to infect a, a, a new susceptible host. And then it injects that DNA from this host into this bacterium. And I have an animation for that as well. Recombination at the molecular level occurs in three different varieties, homologous recombination or site-specific or transposition. And I have an animation for transposition and I have just a couple slides that illustrate homologous and site-specific. So homologous recombination, you need recombination proteins, obviously, and it's usually the reciprocal exchange of, of pairs of DNA molecules with similar or the same nucleotide sequence. It doesn't have to be the exact same. And so homologous recombination might look like this, where you have a um, <clears throat> you have a, a two two strands of D, or two double helix two double helices next to each other, and uh, um, you know this one uh, sustains a double stranded break, and the rec proteins are responsible for that. And you can see the little staggered ends that that creates. Rec, rec A then promotes strand invasion and a D loop. So there's the D loop. And there's strand invasion taking place. And then these guys basically can, um, you know, a couple different outcomes can happen here. As you can see, you can get non-recombinant chromosomes where basically just a piece of this guy goes into here and a piece of that guy goes into here. And so you see the, the net result. The, um, <clears throat> but over here, you get recombinant chromosomes, which is essentially like, I don't know, changing tracks on a train, for example. And so the way, these, the, the way this event takes place is this train track here connects with that, and this train track here connects with that, and so you end up going like this, essentially. So you, know, so you, you can kind of see how these guys have, have um, become hybrid chromosomes. So part of the blue, but then the rest of it is this violet-looking <laughs> sequence, and then this guy here is the violet, and, and the rest of it's blue. So again, it's, it's literally like... like swapping tracks on a train track. And over here, it's far more subtle, right? Where you have, um, you know, just pieces are exchanged. This is a non-reciprocal homologous recombination, meaning that the uh, you have a donor and a host strand. And so the, there's strand invasion. And then, the, and then this, this piece is essentially, um, this piece is essentially cut here so that you get this heteroduplex that's formed. And as a result, the um, um, resulting um, heteroduplex DNA will semi-conservatively replicate, and so that one strand will will be will represent the blue red blue sequence, and then the second strand will be the purely blue sequence, and then that that uh, um, heteroduplex will then reform in the progeny bacteria from this particular um, origin. Transposons are segments of DNA that move about the genome in a process called transposition. And so they can integrate in different sites. They're also called jumping genes, which um, <clears throat> is a um, pretty accurate term. The simplest transposable, el transposable elements are just insertion sequences that just kind of jump into the genome with no additional um, hunks of DNA associated with them. They're just jumping genes. That's all they do. They jump around. They can disrupt genes and cause mutations and, and, and alter the way genes are expressed in the chromosome, but they don't add any novel DNA. But gene, the transposons can be more sophisticated where the insertion sequences pick up antibiotic resistances, for example, and then they not only jump into a gene but, or jump into a genome, but they can also insert really potentially important genes. So here's an uh, example of the transposable elements. And so you have DR stands for direct repeat and indirect repeat, or inverted repeat, <laughs> inverted repeat, and then the transposase gene, which facilitates all the movement, and then another inverted repeat and another direct repeat. So these are direct repeats of each other. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. And these guys are inverted repeats of each other. One, two, three, four, four, three, two, one. And so these guys are, are um, typical flanking sequences that would um, flank a transposase gene. And so this is, a, um, this is an insertion sequence. And again, because it's just these sequences 
flanking a transposate so that this piece of DNA can move around. A transposon, however, is more sophisticated. It's, it's basically the insertion sequence element that you see, but other things are picked up along with it, like antibiotic resistance. And, and even, even more sophisticated are um, replicative type transpos transposases, where you have um, the insertion sequence, but then a resolve-based gene, which helps it jump back out of the genome once it's gone in. So we'll focus on simple transposition, just the cut and paste transposition, um, where the transposase um, catalyzes its own excision and um, cleaves and cleavage of a new target site is important because that facilitates insertion and ligation to the site. So in this particular case, you can see that simple transposition here, are the inverted repeats that I mentioned, the transposase enzyme that's encoded in here. So, so again, these are several thousand base pairs in Lang. So this is by no means should you think it's just this little seven or eight base pair fragment. It's, they're huge. The transposons that I work with are you know, at least a thousand or two thousand base pairs. So the transposase gene will cut at these inverted repeats on the ends here and then pull the DNA out of that transposon and then create a staggered cut in the target DNA, as you see here, and open that up. Then the transpose, uh, transposes can insert the, uh, the um, transposon into the, uh, or insertion sequence into the target DNA, and then the host polymerases will just fill these in. And so that's why you get direct repeats flanking inverted repeats. Bacterial plasmids are a big part of uh, bacterial evolution. So plasmids, hopefully you all know, are small, autonomously replicating DNA molecules. They can exist independently or as episomes um, in which they integrate into their host chromosome. So that's the definition of an episome, when a plasmid integrates in irreversibly uh, into the host chromosome. Um, but they can be uh, conjugative, um, such as the F plasmid and then transfer copies of themselves to other bacteria during conjugation. So I have a brief animation of conjugation, so you can see that. But generally, the anatomy looks like this. Um, over here is the anatomy of these, of these types of, of conjugation-specific plasmids. Some plasmids are simply mobilizable, which means that they can move around, but not on their own. They require a conjugative plasmid to be present as well. And so if we look at the different features of these, you can see they're bracketed here. The um, mobilizable type plasmids have an origin of transfer where they get cut and unwound to initiate the transfer. They typically have a relaxase protein that keeps the end of the DNA from um, twisting all up on itself and getting all knotty. And so the, uh, and then a type four coupling protein that you see here, which typically has, generates the energy necessary for DNA transfer. However, only the conjugative type plasmids have a type 4 secretion system or genes that encode a type 4 secretion system. And so that's the actual pillus that's responsible for the cell-cell um, DNA and protein exchange. In, that's typical of conjugative um, or bacteria when they're conjugating. So that's what you see here. So you see a mobilizable plasmid that lacks the this blue region here for the production of the type 4 secretion system. So this mobilizable plasmid needs a conjugative plasmid present in order to facilitate its transfer. So this guy has this mobilizable plasmid, has the ORET so it can be cut and it has the relaxase so the relaxase can bind to that cut end and it has the type 4 coupling protein so that it can at least bind its uh, an ATP generating enzyme, or I'm sorry, an ATP hydrolyzing enzyme to a type 4 secretion system if one exists. Again, the conjugative plasmid, which is much bigger, has all of those features. So it can move itself, or it can move, and or it can move the mobilizable plasmid to, the, to a recipient. So a bit about um, bacterial plasmids again. F factors contain the uh, information for the formation of the sex pillow. So that's, again, the conjugative plasmid that I just showed you in the previous. Um, they're also called the um, F factors. So attach um, F plus cell to an F minus cell. That's basically the sex pillus for DNA transfer. 
F factors have insertion sequences that can insist that can assist in plasmid integration if necessary. But and so that's the episome thing that I'd mentioned previously. But typically they exist extra chromosomally and, and, and autonomously replicate. And that's a benefit because sometimes it gives the um, the plasma the autonomy to produce many more copies than are present um, than than would be present if they were just integrated in the genome. Some plasmids you can have 10, 20, 50 copies uh, of itself per genome. So this is just a little bit about the the um, F factor integration. And so in this particular case, here's our F factor plasmid that's been transferred into a um, a recipient. And in this particular case, the F factor has insertion sequences that allow it to integrate and so that it can exist as an episome. And so here's the integration event, and then the net result is this. And so you can kind of follow it along. Um, A is the purple here, green, the green part of the IS on the bacterial chromosome. This yellow right here is the second part of this IS, so it's like this. Follow my cursor. It jumps track, and then two here, O here, one here, and then this um, this yellow here, this green here, and then blue, the uh, purple. So then we end up with an episome here. And again, they can resolve themselves and, and jump out as well. And so here's a picture of that process. And obviously the pillus is, can be huge, but these this cell would be, well, whichever one is a recipient, we can't really tell, but, but um, and, and which is the donor, but these would be pulled together. This pillus would retract and bring this guy closer to this guy or vice versa. Either way, they would, they would come together. And so it look, you know, something like this on a... Um, in a, in, a, in a cartoon version. So again, we have the, but the con conjugated plasmids, an important point to make is they're really large. And so this is, you know, from a, from a lab perspective, we don't tend to use conjugated plasmids as our cloning vectors because they're so darn, darn big that could um, really weigh the cell down if having to replicate that giant plasmid, especially if you add extra genes onto it for a cloning experiment. So, um, <clears throat> But uh, we can use conjugated plasmids to mobilize plasmids into other cells. So imagine this mobilizable plasmid has a, has a gene that we want to clone on it um, or, or, or a gene that we want to move into a recipient to study. And so we would need a, um, an SP or a conjugated plasmid. SP is a self-transmissible plasmid, um, which is synonymous with conjugated plasmid. And so we would have this guy make the bridge for us. And then the mobilizable plasmid can then be moved in so that we could get a recipient with our mobilizable plasmid and the um, gene of interest on it. The type 4 secretion system or pillus, so this right here, or in the previous, you know, this type 4 secretion system, the pillus, the mating pillus. If you look at it more closely, it looks a little something like this, just to give you a sense of the, how sophisticated these things actually are. And so this is the LPS outer membrane of a gram-negative bacterium. Here's the thin peptidoglycan. Here's the plasma membrane. And then all these various accessories. And the um, TRA-A or pillin proteins, there's typically a tip, and there's a lot of extension and retraction proteins. And that 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 and many that hydrolyze ATP in order to facilitate that extension and retraction. So I'll jump into um, um, <clears throat> these the um, specifics of bacterial transformation just for a second, um, but I already talked about the Griffith experiment in a previous lecture. And again, transformation is the uptake of naked DNA by a competent cell followed by incorporation of the DNA into the recipient cell's genome. So by competent cell, I just mean a cell that's capable of, that has the natural machinery in order to pick up free DNA from the environment, because not all cells do. Sometimes you have to trick them to do it. And so if you work in a lab, an E. coli lab, you'll, you'll know that E. coli is not naturally competent. E. coli has to be heat shocked or, you know, hit with an electrical pulse in order to take up free DNA and serve as a, as a cloning um, strain. 
so again, the picture, there's a video of this uh, that I've posted, but this is just sort of the, uh, um, the uh, still image <laughs> of transformation. We have DNA fragments that are taken up by a competent bacterium. Notice how the DNA fragments in this example are double-stranded, and they're, but the, the resulting fragment that comes into the cell is single-stranded. So you can get integration by non-reciprocal recombination, or you can get degradation. Um, if the if the bacterium freaks out and produces a um, immune response essentially to it, here's a transformation with DNA fragments. So in this particular case, a DNA plasmid can be applied to the medium, or the bacterium can encounter it in your gut, or in the soil, or in a pond, or wherever, and take that plasmid up, and then stably incorporate it. Again, if it if it's something that the bacterium can express, and if there's some genes on it that might be useful for the particular environment. So here's, a, here's an example of a, of a you know, possibly useful thing that can happen. So the microbe in this example has, a, um, has specific uptake uh, machinery to, to take in free DNA. The microbe, in this particular case, the free DNA has the, has the genes for lactose utilization. And so the, the gene can be incorporated into the cell as a single strand and then homologously recombine excuse me, <laughs> into, the, into the genome. To, uh, to, to convert this cell into a LAC plus. So it starts off LAC minus, meaning that it can't utilize lactose, and it ends up LAC plus. So now imagine if this is an environment where lactose is abundant, this, this resulting cell would have a significant advantage to be able to eat up that abundant carbon source. As far as DNA uptake in bacterial transformation, up till now you just kind of see it as a you know, random little the little pictures of, uh, you know, <laughs> yellow blobs on the surface, but more specifically what it looks like, the DNA uptake machinery, oops, um, is a uh, um, very specific pillus that, uh, not a very specific pillus, but a pillus that, that um, would, would grab DNA and bring it in. So not, not necessarily, not like a mating pillus per se, but, but, a, um, but more of a, an extension, a stock of proteins. And so in this particular case, there's a few um, important components that are, that are outlined here, like PILQ that aids in the movement of um, <clears throat> DNA across the outer membrane, and then the PILN complex, PIL-E, moves DNA from the periplasm to the peptidoglycan, glycan, and so forth. So you could look at this information and compare it to these images, this image. And so in, in this particular case, on the le left here is gram-positive, and around the right are the gram-negative um, PILA systems. And so imagine this, this is an assembly and retraction and an and extension set of proteins. And so this, this pillus can be put out into the world, entangle DNA, and then be retracted in to bring that DNA into the cell using these different DNA binding proteins, nucleases, pores, and, and, and as a result, the single-stranded DNA can be, can be brought into the cytoplasm. And that's a you know, similar concept in the gram negatives, although the, the arrangement, the, the structure is a little different because you need an extra pore, the pill Q pore out here, to span the outer membrane. And then you have, um, but again, you have assembly and retraction and extension proteins. You have a pore in the, in the cell membrane, and you have nuclease and DNA binding activity presumably occurring here in the periplasm to bring the DNA in and cut it simultaneously. 